Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner. And on today's edition, we see the return of the mighty Laura Jane Dodd, Forbidden Planet's head book buyer. Um, now, Laura was in conversation very recently at our flagship store in uh, London, in Shaftesbury Avenue, Forbidden Planet London, 179 Shaftesbury Avenue, with J.M. Moreau, the author of Ordinary Monsters, a fantastic new multi-genre fantasy novel uh, that you can buy a signed copy of from the links attached to this conversation. Laura had a great chat with JM and here they both are. Enjoy. Hi, welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I am the head book buyer for Forbidden Planet, Laura Dodd, and I'm here today to talk to JM Moreau about ordinary monsters. So what can you tell us about this feat of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, Dickensian X-Men? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I think that was pretty good. What you were saying. Good. <laughs> uh, I'm. Uh, I mean, first of all, thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, sometimes the the author's the, the absolute worst person, the last person you should ask what their book is about, uh, because if they could say it in in, in a span of time that's briefer than 600 pages, they probably would have tried. Uh, but I'll do my best. It's. Um, it's the story about children uh, who are born with unusual abilities, talents as they're called in the book. Uh, it's set in the Victorian era. In particular, it, it opens by following these, these, these two children um, who are uh, being pursued by a sinister man of smoke. Yeah. And there are um, two private detectives who are trying to find these children and bring them back to a safe refuge in Scotland uh, before the man of smoke gets them. So you do... You do kind of have a, almost like a day job as a poet, so how did the writing process differ from your poetry to this? Well, again, thank you. I think that's the only time anyone's ever called what I do as a poet I'm a day job. I'm so sorry. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a job, I guess, if you don't get paid for it. Um, well, uh, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, writing poetry and, and writing prose, they, 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 they come from the same place, uh, but the, the how of it, the way that you're expressing what you're, where it's coming from, changes the nature of what you're saying entirely. Uh, you know, poetry is very much about um, the breath. It's about um, controlling the breath, units of measure, uh, finding ways to, to translate what you um, what you're observing into the world descriptions and uh, concrete language with the world around you. And it's not really about um, storytelling in the same way. So writing a novel like this compared to, say, poetry involves um, entirely different beats, uh, entirely different um, movements of, of thought. And of course, you know, the big one is the characters. You know, poetry doesn't have characters in the same way. I think you've as as well kind of managed to have quite a poetic style to um, to this book. So is that something you're kind of conscious of, or does it just happen serendipitously? So. Oh well, um, you know, I I I don't think that that the the way that I write is changing with with the kind of story that I'm telling. Yeah, so I think that's just part of something that comes naturally for me. Uh, you know, I I do resist. You know, there there's a kind of um, poet's novel that gets talked about. It tends to be very flowery and ornate, and perhaps it lacks a certain degree of clarity. And some of those books can be very beautiful. Yeah, but that's really not the kind of writing that I like to think that I do. Yeah, I, I like to think it's a little bit um, more concrete, a little bit more specific, and maybe harder. But there are moments where you know, prose can be sort of at the level of speech and talking, and then it can also sometimes lift up into this level of singing. And there are moments in the novel where I think passages lift above the, the ordinary speaking. So, uh, Ordinary Monsters travels from America to Edinburgh via kind of Victorian uh, London. Uh, what research did you do in these different kind of time periods to kind of get the, the right feel? Um, well, uh, Nearly every location in the book that's written about I've, I've physically been to, which helps. I, you know, because the novel is set 100, almost 150 years ago, uh, I can't actually ever <laughs> be there. Um, so, you know, there's a certain degree of latitude that your imagination immediately 
uh, is allowed. Uh, but having physically been there, experienced um, things like, and it sounds strange, but things like the weather, you know, the, the, the feel of the temperature and the air on your skin, these things really um, can help make a difference in terms of imagining your characters moving through space. There's a lot of reading that gets done. There's some terrific uh, nonfiction books out there. Uh, there's also a lot of primary sources available from this period uh, of history uh, that you can find on the internet, which is very, very useful. Um, and I'm also, I'm a very visual uh, writer and a very visual, in, in, you know, in my imagination. So finding old photographs, old images like that, uh, those are the sorts of things that, that really help to do the book. You also get uh, glimpses of Japan in one of my absolute favorite segments. So have you ever had the opportunity to go to Japan as well? I have, yes. Yeah, um, that section required a lot more research, mm -hmm. of course, uh, than um, some of the other sections. Uh, but yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting because there have been significant changes, of course, um, physically. Uh, in, in in the place that I'm writing about Japan, um, so it's difficult to to, to be there. Yeah, but you know, um, one of the it, and this might sound peculiar. I don't know. One of the, the touchstones for me with, with that section was uh, uh, an, an old Mizuguchi film, uh, which was set uh, in this in this time period in an old Japanese theater. Yeah, um, and I found that extremely useful to watch the film. Yeah, it definitely, it had that kind of yokai feel to it, and yes, yeah, behind behind the scenes of the theatre, which is, yeah, very, very good. Um, so, the, the history of the, the so-called talents and their powers are very inventive and very kind of fully formed. Was this all kind of carefully planned, or did it obviously mutate as you were writing? Well, there's a lot of development. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I had early was this, um, these children. You know, I, I knew that I wanted to write a book uh, that took some of the people from this, this time period, say the orphans, the children, the unprotected ones, women, the, the more powerless, uh, and gave them a degree of agency. And I wanted, I mean, there, there certainly is a magic system in the book. Um, there's a discussion about how their how their abilities work, but the impetus for the, the talents and for their, their their abilities was almost closer to metaphor or poetry. So you know, for instance, and I, without spoilers, um, there's uh, a little girl who grows up on the streets unprotected, and it's exactly the kind of figure that would have gone completely unseen by anyone else in society around her. Uh, and she has the ability to turn invisible. There's a um, uh, young boy who's half black in the American South, suffering extreme physical abuse, and he has the talent to uh, heal himself. Uh, and, you know, so I was sort of taking what would have been a source of, of, of great sorrow or suffering uh, and trying to flip that so it allowed them the kind of power there. Um, agency. So I kind of knew that I wanted the powers to, to work in that fashion. And then when it came to the Man of Smoke, you know, part of what I was thinking early on was that I, I felt a little bit like these disenfranchised, disempowered um, figures who, who I wanted to stand at the center of the book, what they were really pushing against was the age itself, the time itself, which was a cruel one and a difficult one for so many people in so many ways. And so I, I, I kind of had this image of these children in Victorian London, surrounded by the fog, the smog, the brownouts, almost as if the fog itself was pushing on them. And that fog, I think, took the shape of a man. And that's kind of where the man of smoke came from. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he's incredibly terrifying, and, and his backstory is so kind of rich in detail. So where did you start writing the Man of Smoke? Well, he started, um, again, without spoilers, Yes. <laughs> uh, which gets a little bit tricky. Uh, I had to discover who he was. So I very much saw him from the outside, which made him more sinister and more menacing for me. Um, I had people talking about him uh, in the writing of the book. 
before I myself really quite understood who he was and what he was. Uh, so I, I felt the degree of menace as he was creeping closer to getting onto the page. Um, and then the moment that we start to approach his backstory and um, begin to maybe understand a little bit about how he become, became who he is, that was kind of the moment where um, I understood that this book was not, it was not a simple story about good versus evil, but it was as much a story about how good can become evil, or how actions can be misguided, or how the, the things that we might be doing for the best of reasons um, can cause a terrific amount of harm in the process. There's also um, in the book lots of kind of very um, filmic kind of action sequences. Were they quite fun, fun to write? They're fun to have had written. <laughs> uh, the the actual process was pretty complicated. Uh, um, for I, I'm thinking of I think a, a couple of ones that you're thinking of. Mm -hmm. uh, it it took a lot of work. Um, I actually would take um, little little chess pieces and, and and lay them out on my floor of my office and in order just to keep track of who was where at any particular moment. Yeah, uh, because it was. It was difficult to make sure that the pattern, the sequence of events for each character moving through was continuing to propel the tension. So there's a lot of work that went into that. Wow, that's very intricate about the chess. <laughs> oh my god. Um, I was going to ask a question about um, d and I might actually ask it um, now, I think. Um, so I think we mentioned briefly yesterday at Comic Con about kind of D&D &D and, and gaming and, and things like that. Um, so. A while ago, we had uh, Garth Nix on FPTV, and a fan made a Sabriel D and D setting, which he was uh, he amazing. loved. Would you like to see this as a D and D setting? Oh well, your world brought to life. And if, if so, if anyone out there wants, to. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. It would, it would be incredible. Yeah, no question. Oh my god, I, yeah, I could, I could just see how this would like. No, be a dungeon master stream. So. <laughs> um, so uh, also, I think a really important part of this book is the the themes of kind of found family and and especially obviously motherhood. Um, so where did you start with that kind of idea of found family? Because also there's there's the kind of I suppose the quintessential we mentioned X Men before, obviously with the kind of the the powers, but also with the kind of found family element. So where did you start with that and are you an X-Men fan? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm definitely an X-Men fan. Uh, you know, <laughs> X-Men wasn't my thing. Um, it was always Amazing Spider-Man. That, yes. that was the one. And my older brother collected X-Men when we were kids. Um, and you know, if your older brother takes one thing, then you have to take something else. Yeah. So I, I, I didn't get X-Men. Um, but I mean, who doesn't love it? Uh, the, the found family, you know, it's strange to say because this is a, it's a historical fantasy novel set in the Victorian era with um, children with unusual abilities and, and some, some apocalyptic things going on. Uh, but in some ways it's a very, it, it comes from a very autobiographical source. It's very personal. Um, book and it took me a while to kind of figure that out. You know, sometimes the books know more than we do, and you know, when you live with them for so long, you're staring at them, and they're, you know, eventually, if, if you if you can listen closely enough, you can hear some of the things that they're saying. And you know, I um, when I was a, a boy, uh, dreaming of being a writer, it was fancy novels that I was reading and that I wanted to write and that I was in love with, and they mattered so much to me because I was uh, I was a very solitary boy. I was lonely. I was bullied very very badly in, in my elementary years, and this was in a time before the internet. Uh, I had no community. I was growing up in a small town. Uh, there were no like-minded kids um, to, to you know find my my community with, and I found that that refuge, that companionship in fantasy novels and stories. Um, and at the time, in the 80s, it was, of course, you know, and it was a small mall bookstore that I had to go to. So it was, of course, you know, the, the Terry Brooks and the Tad Williams and the Robert Jordan and the Anne McCaffrey and on and on and on, the, the, the big blockbuster series that I, of Dragonlance that I was reading. And so many of those books were stories about, uh, say, I mean, often it was a boy back then, but it was, you know, um, uh, a child who thought they were ordinary, but they turned out to be extraordinary. Right? Um, and 
for for a kid who very much was feeling you know, bullied and and, and and in pain every day, there was there was a great solace with that. You know, you, you are important. You do matter. Uh, so I think when I was writing this book, I was thinking of that boy, that that that, that boy that I was on, on some level, and thinking, you know, if only I could reach across the decades and say to him, you know, just hang in there. It's going to be all right. There are people out there that, you know, that you'll you'll find your, your family. You'll find your people. Uh, it's okay to be different from all the other kids. Um, and so I think that the theme, this idea of found family, came about purely from this overwhelming push that, that was inside me for the story. I think we can probably just both the staff that work at the Planet, but a lot of our customers can probably sympathise and relate to kind of being like lonely kids and growing up in a time before the internet. Yeah, maybe it was. <laughs> it's a lot harder to kind of find your people, but um, but you get there in the end. Um, and weirdly enough, you just mentioned Dragonlance. There's actually a new Dragonlance novel coming out this September, which I was amazed at because that I hadn't seen for years and I was just like, oh Jack and that's back. <laughs> so right. it's very is that, exciting. Is that also Hickman and Yes. Right? Yes, yeah. I I heard about so that. yes, yeah. So there's a lot of very classic uh, books kind of coming back because there's also a new uh, Dritz novel as well. So yeah, yeah. This year is all about the classics coming back. So um, so you mentioned just before about uh, a few authors that you were reading kind of um, when you were younger. Um, is there any um, authors who you're particularly um, enjoying now or any kind of underrated authors um, that you'd like to give a shout out to? Oh, uh, well there's so many. You know, I, I usually dodge that question <laughs> because I inevitably fail to mention somebody and then I feel terrible about it. So I, I'll, I'll sidestep the question, but what I, what I will say is that I, um, I, I do feel like uh, SFF is, is in this incredibly, it's this golden period where there's so much out there and there's so much excellent writing out there and so many different voices are, are, are emerging and they're telling new stories and interesting stories and, and, and there's pretty much anything that you might want to find is out there if you know where to look. I think it's pretty exciting. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the the choice now, and like you touched on before, there was there was a period where maybe there wasn't as definitely not as no, uh, diverse kind of fiction and authors coming through. And now there's just such a, a gamut of possibilities. It's, it's amazing. Um, so in in regards back to ordinary monsters, um, how do you envisage the rest of the series kind of? going? Is it all kind of planned out or are you going to be rushing home after this and like starting with you? Um, it, it's, it's planned out is a, is a very optimistic way to describe it. It was <laughs> planned out and then um, by the time the editing on this first book was done, some of the things were no longer feasible, which required, you know, and that's just kind of how it goes with writing a book. So, this, the second book, I'm, I'm, I'm well on the way to finishing. We should be on track to publishing next year. Um, uh, I have a very clear idea about what that needs to do. The third book, I mean, I sort of have always thought of it as a single big story. Okay. Um, so I've, I've kind of always had a, a, a pretty good idea about what I needed to do in the third book. Uh, and as I said, that's changed a little bit, but not in its basic fundamentals. The the cover design for Ordinary Monsters is absolutely uh, stunning. <coughs> so check this out. So um, how much input did you have in the cover design? I trust you're happy with it. <laughs> oh, well, I, it's so beautiful that I wish I could say that I had anything to do with it. I, I absolutely love it. You know, yeah, we, we, the, the brilliant designer sent along um, a first image, first design, which was gorgeous, but it didn't quite seem to capture the, the atmosphere of the book. And then this one just came fully formed. Yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, absolutely beautiful it's beautiful so yeah yeah very very nice so perfect so just just to wrap up so your visit to the uk um so what have you enjoyed most so far in the uk well there are so many lovely things about the uk uh 
easily the, the high point for me has been the Comic Con. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was, it was extraordinary. You know, I, it was my first Comic Con. Yeah. Uh, not that I haven't always wanted, I mean, who doesn't want to go to a Comic Con, but uh, where I live, it's not as possible. But the, it was such, I mean, in some ways it was exactly what I could have hoped it would be. You know, it, it felt so welcoming. It was such a safe space for everybody. And there was such a, a, a friendliness and a gentleness about everybody around that, that I mean, I, it was quite a moving experience. I loved it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Can't say more than that. So, well, we're so happy to have you here and so happy to have lots of uh, signed copies. So these will be available very soon on ForbiddenPlanet.com and in all nine of our stores. So you can go check out any of our stores, including our London flagship, and grab yourself a signed copy. Uh, but for now, thank you so much, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.